going to be sharing with you, do it, I'm going to do something a little different tonight. Uh, I'm going to pause my study on the church uh, tonight. I want to share something with you from my heart. Not that the other things were not from my heart, but uh, uh, maybe a little bit more from my heart. So uh, anyway, you should have received, for those of you who are here, should have received a prayer list. Let me encourage you to uh, keep that handy. Um, let me go to the back. Some upcoming uh, activities. Um, first and foremost, uh, your staff this coming Sunday when you show up, don't feel like that we have abandoned you. We're just going to be gone. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention is next week and the pastor's conference starts on Sunday evening, so we're going to be gone uh, next sun this coming Sunday. Uh, Brother Richard Dayringer, who has recently joined our church, uh, is going to uh, preach, and I encourage you to uh, be here and be faithful and listen to him. Brother Matt is, is going to be the only one of the staff that is here, okay, uh, that week, uh, that Sunday, so uh, make sure you encourage him, uh, but anyway, we're going to... Um, still have church and we encourage you to be faithful and uh, we will uh, you all will meet together and then um, I apologize for some of you uh, what we are doing on Sunday nights uh, we have not we've kind of put a hold on our discipleship training or discipleship first classes uh, we are doing some special Sunday nights but we're not doing every Sunday night so um, some of you showed up this past Sunday night. Just look at your bulletin and uh, be a little bit more concise in seeing what's there and what's not there. And if you show up and we're not here, go get you a blizzard. That seems to be the common wisdom. Is that right, Carolyn? Okay. All right. So, yeah. So anyway, uh, as far as the upcoming activities, cross timbers. That's a camper's meeting. Most of you don't have to worry about that. Our kids are, our youth are out of camp. I'm going to go there as soon as we get done here tonight uh, for the service. And uh, so far, uh, good things. Uh, I've got to set in on a few of the services out there. And there's been some salvation decisions. And uh, probably about 350 to 400 kids out at camp this week. Uh, we've got somewhere around 12, I believe, plus sponsors, and uh, so, so far everything's going well. Brother Daniel is the camp director for our youth camp, so he's having to stay pretty busy out there uh, wearing a bunch of hats, and uh, so our, one of our uh, new members, Dax Everett's and his family, Dax is the camp, um, what do they call him now? Caretaker, thank you. I, I was looking for that name. He is the camp caretaker now out there. Uh, some of you remember Brother Keith Lozier, who had been there for years. Uh, but Dax, uh, who is a he's a member of our church, he is uh, the caretaker out there. So uh, believe me, he's running ragged this week because, see, we didn't have camp last year. And so it was been about two years. And so they had a tractor that was not working. They've had an air conditioner go out in the dining hall. They've had several different things happen, you know, kind of all at once. So, but they're, they're getting them fixed and everything, so things are going well. But just uh, pray for them. Uh, they'll go through Friday morning, and uh, then they will come back. And you'll probably, uh, well, Daniel won't be here either, so I don't know what you'll hear Sunday. So just come, see what you hear. Uh, now, on July the 11th, Carolyn, we're going to have a church-wide bowling night. And I've always wanted to, see, I've always wanted to get three other pastors and have a bowling team and call ourselves the Holy Rollers. But it, I just haven't been able to do it yet, so. Yeah, right there? Okay. Well, anyway, that's a church-wide thing. We're going to offer... Um, uh, transportation. If you don't want to go and drive yourself, we're going to Miami, and uh, this is just going to be uh, a time of fellowship together, 
and sign up at the event table if you plan on going. I think we've already got over 30 that want to go. And so remember that. Now out here, just past the doors, is the Falls Creek food donation. You can take one of those envelopes. I think they go as low maybe as $10 and all the way up to maybe 100 But if you'd like to help us with the Falls Creek food, which when we take our kids July the 5th through the 10th, uh, just take one of those envelopes and uh, put a check or money in there, make it to the church, and uh, we'll make sure that goes for Falls Creek food, and that, that will uh, help us in that regards, okay? And then we're going to have a special call business meeting on June the 23rd. That is on Wednesday night, so you need to make note of that. Following Bible study, we're going to uh, share with you uh, a situation involving a roof repair over in our uh, NPR Fellowship Hall and also a flat roof that goes around uh, the auditorium here. Uh, so we'll be making uh, uh, budget and finance and our properties committee will be making recommendations concerning that. And it is important. A lot of money is going to be spent, but we've also received money from our insurance so we just need to make you all aware of some things and uh, uh, need you to be uh, up front or need to know what's going on. So special call business meeting on June the 23rd. We, need to, we have to announce that at least two services ahead of time. So we're starting tonight so that you can know about that. Okay. All right. I believe that is everything that I need to share with you at this point. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then I'll share with you some things tonight that uh, I want to make you aware of. So let's bow for a word of prayer together. Our Father, we praise your name tonight for allowing us to come together as a church family. And Father, we have those who are here uh, in person and those who are online. And Lord, we may uh, have individuals that are not members of our church that are uh, looking in tonight. I pray, Father, that you would bless them and their families. And we pray, Father, that uh, you would uh, be ever so close uh, to individuals through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, be with our youth tonight, Brother Daniel, and those of them that are out in, um, at GLBA. Uh, they're having services tonight. Pray, Father, for the speaker that has come in to preach God's word. And so, Father, your will be done. There's a lot of kids out there. There's a lot of students, a lot of sponsors. And uh, we believe that Grand Lake Baptist Assembly is a gift that you've given us to be able to use as ministry uh, to reach young people and children uh, for Christ. Uh, so, Father, your will be done in that situation tonight. Uh, Father, be with our country tonight. Uh, we, we, we have situations that uh, uh, if we really look uh, from a general standpoint, it seems to be everything is negative. But Father, we know that you are moving, that you are investing in lives, and we're seeing good things happen. Sometimes they just don't get reported. And so, Father, uh, I pray that uh, you would help us to regardless of what is going on in our world, that we would remain faithful to you and to be individuals who are willing to share the gospel uh, wherever we go. Lord, we're going to have opportunities, I believe, if not on a daily basis, at least every other day, to be able to share our faith, to be able to be a positive witness for you, and I pray that that would happen. Uh, Lord, tonight I pray, uh, I pray for our denomination, uh, the Southern Baptist uh, convention is made up of uh, close to 40,000 churches or so, maybe a little more than that across the United States. And Lord, we're going to be having uh, this meeting next week. And Father, I'm going to be sharing a little bit with our congregation tonight and asking for their prayers. And so Lord, I just ask you, Lord, to, um, to guide us. Uh, Lord, there's, uh, we can find things to argue and gripe about. But Lord, uh, when we see somebody come to know Christ, when we see missionaries that are being planted to serve in various uh, places, uh, Father, when we 
uh, see young men and women called to the ministry. Lord, when we see new churches planted, those are things that I believe that uh, incur- you know, certainly you are happy with and that you desire. So, uh, Lord, tonight meet with us. Again, thank you for these who are here tonight, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I I gave you a handout tonight. I'm going to be looking at that in just a minute as well. But uh, I wanted to kind of bring you up to date since I'm not going to be here Sunday. I think it's good to make you as a congregation aware of, of what goes on sometimes in a denomination. And you may not be that familiar with uh, Southern Baptists as a whole. Maybe you've been a Baptist, but you've not necessarily been a Southern Baptist in the past or whatever. And, you know, I'm not here to tout denominationalism. I am a Christian first. Uh, I believe that that's the main thing that we need to be uh, concentrating on is the fact that we uh, are believers in Christ and that we need to be um, disciples, and then we need to be sharing Christ with the lost world. And I do believe that we are trying to do that uh, as a denomination. Uh, we are about 15 to 16 million strong as far as uh, numbers. We are the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. Don't necessarily say that with pride, because I'm not sure if we had to find all 15 million or 16 million of them we could, but uh, that's what we claim, okay? Now, uh, next week, uh, we will go to the Southern Baptist Convention in Nashville, Tennessee. That happens to be the headquarters of our denomination. Uh, Myself, my wife, Brother Thomas, Chrissy, uh, Brother Daniel, and Ashlyn will go. We are messengers from this church, and we will go, and we will uh, register and we will be a part of the process there. Now, there's going to be preaching, there's going to be singing, uh, we're going to worship, but we're also going to conduct business as a denomination. One time a year we meet as a denomination. When we're not meeting as a denomination, we have an executive committee that is made up of different individuals from different states. I believe we have two Uh, here in Oklahoma that represent us and then the various uh, uh, state denominations and some of our pioneer missionaries uh, in the Northwest and things like that. I think there's around 42 or so individuals that make up the executive committee. And I believe they meet four times a year and they kind of conduct the business of the Southern Baptist Convention when we're not meeting as a convention, okay? Now, you say, why are you telling me all this? Well, because... Next week, we're going, when, when, when we meet, there are some issues that have developed uh, that uh, the secular press loves controversy. Uh, folks, if we were getting along as Southern Baptists and if everything was going well and there wasn't anything going on that was quote-unquote difficult or whatever, they wouldn't give us the time of day, you wouldn't see anything in the paper. But if something happens that's controversial or something, then uh, they love it. They're like vultures to a carcass. Uh, The only problem is we're not a carcass. We're still alive, okay? I will tell you that. Now, uh, I'm going to share with you some things that are going on, and uh, uh, one of them happens to be critical race theory, and we're going to talk about that. Some of you may not even know what that is about and you've listened to it being shared on TV, CRT for short is what it's called. I'm going to try to help you tonight with that a little bit. Not that I know uh, anything more than you, but I have tried to uh, educate myself on these things and try to be uh, uh, as relevant as I can, okay? Now, the two things that I know that are probably going to come up are is the critical race theory, and then... (laughs) We have a church in California that decided uh, that they were going to ordain some women to be pastors. You know the pastor. His name's Rick Warren. Saddleback, 
Community Church. Uh, what, is, what was his famous book? I just went blank. Purpose Driven Life. Thank you very much, Thomas. Sold, I think, over 60 million copies somewhere in that. Uh, it's been out here, out there for, I don't know, 20 years, 15 years. But anyway, that now, here's the way we function. We are not a denomination that has bishops and, um, you know, popes and things like that. We don't have somebody telling us what to do. We are an autonomous church, local church. Grows First Baptist Church, we govern ourselves under the, in, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't call the shots. The deacons don't call the shots. The staff doesn't call the shots. But through a collective uh, membership, we uh, attempt to uh, reach people for Christ and to function as a church body, okay? So the Saddleback Church has done what it's going to do on its own terms. Now, we as a denomination have put within our Baptist faith a message, and I happen to have one of these tonight. And if you don't have one of these, there's some out there in the foyer. Uh, but this is a statement of faith. We are not a creedal people, a Southern Baptist. We are simply statement of faith people, which means that we believe that the Bible is our guidebook. It is inspired, it is inerrant, it is infallible. It means it's without error. We believe that God breathed uh, Scripture. In fact, in 2 Peter 1, uh, verse 20 and 21, it says, But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Okay, and then we have 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. The word inspired there literally means God breathed, okay? So we believe the words of this scripture from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is God's breathing words to us, okay? But we do have a statement of faith, and we have some articles of belief but all that we do that we put in here is based on the scriptures, okay? And so one of the things that we have added, this is the Baptist Faith and Message that was adopted on June the 14th, 2000. This is 21 years old. We've had, we had one in 1925, the Baptist Faith and Message. Then we revised it in 1973, I believe, somewhere in that neighborhood, and then the, the year 2000, okay? Now, let me just read to you. Here's where the issue uh, lies. And if I can find it, I meant to actually... Uh, eh, hang on. There's only... Yeah, here we go, the church. All right. We have the Article 7, or excuse me, Article 6, the church. It says, The New Testament Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is an autonomous local congrega congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the two ordinances of Christ, which are Lord's Supper and Baptism, governed by his laws, exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. Each congregation operates under the lordship of Christ through democratic processes. In such a congregation, each member is responsible and accountable to Christ as Lord its scriptural officers are pastors and deacons. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by scripture. Okay? So, Rick Warren and his church, according to many of us, has violated part of the Baptist faith and message. Now, that's going to be an issue next week, so just keep your antennas open. And you'll hear, you know, somebody's probably going to put a resolution out and say that we disfellowship the Saddleback Community Church. Now, folks, that is, by the way, that is the largest Southern Baptist church in our denomination. So I just, just want to take, hang on, Philip, no questions yet. Then, um, so we got that issue, okay, how we handle that. Now, let me tell you, folks, the majority of Southern Baptist churches do not believe 
that we should have women pastors. Ladies, no offense to you, but the scripture is very clear about that, okay? So it's not, a, a, it's not an issue across the convention, but there are people that are wanting to try to make it an issue, okay? So how we deal with Saddleback Church, by the way, Pastor Rick Warren is retiring. Maybe this is shot across the bow on his way out. I don't know. But anyway, we'll deal with that, okay? So you're going to hear about that. You're also, you may hear about a couple of letters that have been leaked by Dr. Russell Moore, who used to be the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission president. He has since resigned in May, uh, this past May. But in going out, he has, some letters have been leaked about some issues. Now, back in 2018 or so, there was a Houston Chronicle article about some abuse that was going on in churches across the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, folks, we are made up of people all across this United States. So the chances that sexual abuse, uh, things like that that have happened in churches made up of human beings has probably, I'm certain, has happened because they are documented. But there is some controversy in regards to this because Dr. Moore is saying that some of our leaders within the executive committee uh, have tried to hide this or have tried to suppress it and not got it out in the open. So you're probably going to hear some things about that. So just I want you to be aware of those things because, uh, again, the world loves controversy. We're going to try to deal with it as Southern Baptists. Again, I am a messenger. My wife is one. We have voting privileges. We will vote. You, can't, you don't tell me how to vote as a congregation. Now, if you want to after the service is over, say, Brother Jim, by the way, when you go to Nashville, I'd like for you to make sure that this and this happens or this and this doesn't happen. And I, I will listen to you. But between the Lord and myself and my conscience, we'll also vote on a new president as well. Now, the president is not like the president of the United States. He doesn't have a lot of power as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's kind of a figurehead type thing, but he does have some appointment powers and things that he can put on some committees, individuals. And it is important who we have to lead us. So pray about that. There's four men, I think three of them are pastors, or two of them are pastors, and two of them are denominational leaders that have dis said they will, they're going to put their names in for, um, to be president, okay? So that will be brought up as well, okay? So wanted to make you aware of the one being a theological thing. And folks, let me just say this as a pastor. Not only Southern Baptist churches, but other churches as well, we in the past probably have not done a very good job when it comes to this sexual uh, immorality stuff. Let me tell you what happens. And I'm on the air, so this is going to get elsewhere. A church will call an individual, say, let's say they call a minister of education. And let's say that minister of education has some moral failings, but that church didn't know about it. And he gets on the scene, and within six months, they find out something happens at that church. And he violates something very clearly that goes against Scripture, moral failing, whatever it may be, okay? What usually happens is they try to get rid of the gentleman, the individual, as quickly as possible and try to sweep it under the rug. Now, I'm not saying this about everybody. And what happens is, is that individual is allowed to leave and go somewhere else. Now, as a pastor, that's been the issue. And I think what you may see is some kind of a task force that is going to look at some of these issues and say, look, we can't sweep this stuff under the rug anymore. If a church has someone who has a moral failing, that needs to be brought out in a proper way. And that person needs to, be, needs to go through counseling, probably never needs to go back into the ministry. And if they can be restored to Christian faith, living their life in a different way as far as not being in the ministry, then so be it. We need to reclaim that individual if all possible, okay? 
So those are some of the things that we're dealing with as a denomination. So I wanted to, I want to bring that out to you. I want to be as transparent as I can with you on that. Now, Philip, you had a question a while ago. Do you still have one? Well, those situations, you know, uh, are dealt with individually within, you know, a congregation and stuff. Sometimes, if, if there is child abuse, they have to be reported to authorities and things like that, yes. Some of these are not necessarily child abuse situations as much as they may be a moral failing between one man and one woman in the church, okay? They're, and they're not married, okay? That certainly has happened before. And yes, there have been some individuals who have taken advantage of, of young girls in Baptist churches, I'm sorry to say, and some of those individuals have, as far as I know, well, when you say they, again, please understand, hang on, Philip, let me answer the question. Each church is an individual autonomous church. They deal with it. We can't deal with it as I can't tell somebody else what to do as Grove's First Baptist Church. Now, we as a dom denomination, if we find out that a church is not doing something proper, we can do something. Hopefully, that church will handle it in such a way with the authorities and everything the way it's supposed to be, okay? So, all I'm asking you, as far as Mr. Warren, I have no idea. I cannot tell you his motives. I don't know that he is said anything publicly about that other than the fact that he's ready to go out he's like festus he's getting the heck out of dodge we can't shut philip i don't know that we can shut any noise down again it's a lo local autonomous church that can do what they want okay that's what i was trying to tell you all ago okay now let me share with you the other thing, and this is what you have. Look in front of you if you've got the handout. This particular situation will cause some controversy, too. Let me share with you. How many of you understand what critical race theory is? All right, we've got a few. I've given you a bare bones uh, thing here. I encourage you to go to the website at the bottom if, you are politic if you're computer savvy. And this uh, particular website will give you some more information. I, ha I ha actually happen to have part of that information here with me tonight. I will tell you, well, let me, let me read this first. Okay, critical race theory, the view that the law and legal institutions are inherently racist and that race itself, instead of being biologically grounded and natural, is a socially constructed concept that is used by white people to further their economic and political interests at the expense of people of color. According to critical race theory, racial inequalities emerge from the social, economic, and legal differences that white people create between races to maintain elite white interest in labor markets and politics giving rise to poverty and criminality in many minority communities. The CRT movement officially organized itself in 1989 at the first, first annual workshop on critical race theory, okay? Now, I, that was a bare bones thing. I'll, I'll get into a little bit more of it here in a minute. Basically, critical race theory got its birth in our colleges and universities. And folks, that's where a lot of the problem is today. You've got tenured professors. They can't be touched. And some of them have began to advocate some of this. You'll see now, you don't, you know, you still see the, you know, economic degrees, somebody getting a 
journalism degree, somebody getting a biology degree or a teaching degree, but you have people today who are getting degrees that really don't mean a whole lot, but they are Latino, and I'm not, please understand, whatever, whatever group I call out, I'm just using as an example, but they're are Latino studies that you can, that can be your major, African American studies in college, you can do all different kinds of things. And this is where some of these things are being implanted into our college students. And it is a breeding ground for some of this. That's why a lot of these, some of these uh, riots and things that you've seen in the United States, especially since last summer, and some of these statue tearing down parties have been college students because they were taught this. Critical race theory tells us that, and along with the 1619 Project, you've prob maybe you've heard that, our country was not founded in 1776, it was founded in 1619, and the reason why we were founded as a nation according to CRT people is because we were racist individuals and because we wanted slavery. Now you and I know that that's not true. But that's the propaganda. See, what they have to do, they have to change, they have to revise the history, they have to tear down the statues, and then they have to tear down our form of government and our economic system. Most people that support critical race theory, not all of them, but the majority of them, also support Marxism. And this CRT was founded under the principles of European Marxism. And I'll get into that in just a minute. Now, to be fair, two universities in Oklahoma teach CRT. Guess which ones? Oklahoma University and Oklahoma State University. And I got this off their websites. Oklahoma State University has an anti-racism bias and diversity training. This university the university has implemented, implemented a mandatory training module called Fostering and Promoting a Culture of Diversity and Inclusion at OSU for all students. Every student at OSU has to go through this class, this training. Oklahoma University is the same way. It's called the Senior Capstone Experience. General education requirement will be replaced with a mandatory diversity, equity, and inclusion course for all students beginning in the fall of 2021. Now you say, well, all right, why are you saying all of that? I'm saying that because this is the breeding ground for what you're hearing. Now, folks, I try not to get too political, but sometimes you have to. You hear the President of the United States, Joe Biden, say very frequently that we are a systemic, racist country. He says it a lot of times. He believes it. And the people that he has put into power also believe it. And so, if it's up to them, every one of us are going to be going through this training. It's already happening in our military. It's already happening in our government. They are making and forcing mandatory requirements. Now let me give you some things. I'll give you some examples here uh, so that you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay? Um, see where I'm at here. Um, critical race theory, um, it's an academic movement and it seeks to link racism race and power and folks it really is basically trying to supplant the civil rights movement of the 1960s you see the civil rights movement in the 1960s the emphasis was equality okay they just wanted everything to be equal if if that person of color gets this, this person of color, whatever it may be, they wanted equality. Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, put us on that path, okay? But now they want to go beyond that and they actually want to supplant that or supplant that and go with this critical race theory, okay? 
And so uh, they argue that uh, the very foundation of our uh, country is racist to the core, and therefore we need to fundamentally transform this country. Have you heard that term fundamentally transform before? 2008, presidential candidate Barack Obama, 2020 candidate Joe Biden. Both of them said we want to fundamentally transform our nation, okay? Now, um, because of all this, we now have the impl implications or the implementing of uh, this uh, particular uh, belief. It's really, folks, more than a belief. It is a, it's a system. It's political. It's economic, social, and in some senses, I would submit to you, it's spiritual. They believe it wholeheartedly, and they're willing to make sure it happens in our country. Several weeks ago, I, I um, subscribed to the Imprimis magazine out of Hill, Hillsdale University in, in uh, Michigan, a very good conservative school. And so I get their, it's called Imprimis, is their magazine. So several weeks ago, I got this uh, uh, particular article. It was the month of April or whatever. And so they had a uh, guest lecturer there at, their co at the college. And so he spoke on critical race theory, what it is, and how to fight it. Okay, obviously he was against it. So he began to, to discuss it. Now, um, he calls it America's new institutional orthodoxy. Uh, he says that it begins, you, in order to understand critical race theory, you've got to understand what Marxism is. Um, Marx wanted to, there to be conflict between the workers and the elite. And he ultimately wanted a revolution well, guess what? It happened in some places. And in most places in the 19th century or early 20th century, it happened in Russia, China, and some of the other places, and folks didn't, do, didn't go too well. Somewhere around 100 million people lost their lives in order for Marxism to be implemented in some of these countries, okay? So... Um, trying to put that model in the United States, people said, you know, that's not going to work. You're not going to be able to divide them by workers' class versus upper elite, so what you've got to do is you've got to divide them by race. And folks, I believe this is, I believe this with all my heart. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, so what you're about to hear, it's, this is my opinion, but I believe I can back it up. We are being divided today over race. When, I mean, 10 years ago, did you hear anybody say that we were sy systemically racist? Oh, you might hear somebody, you know, do their dog and pony show, uh, ambulance chasing uh, individuals that like to make their money off of this stuff. But folks, just recently, this has been, you know, we've seen the riots. We've seen the police situations and the shootings uh, of uh, people of color and things like that. And we've seen in Ferguson, Missouri, we've seen last summer in Minneapolis. By the way, Minneapolis is still burning and still having problems, but the media is not telling you anything. Did you know that? They're still, they call it now mur Murderapolis instead of Minneapolis because murders have gone up exponentially or whatever they call that word. I mean, it's just... It's skyrocketed because they have done away with some of their police. They can't get any of the, you know, they can't even get the police that they have to go to certain areas of Minneapolis because it's so bad, okay? But we're not hearing that because it doesn't fit the narrative of what people want, okay? So anyway, that's what we're running into. Um, 
so let me let me share a few other things with you um it is being interjected into our government agencies public school systems teaching training programs corporate human resource departments in the form of diversity training human resource modules public policy frameworks and school curricula california has already adopted in their whole school system crt they're going to teach it from kindergarten to 12th grade so you need to understand that if you've got any grandchildren in california you might need to warn them and they're going to use some code words like equity they don't use equality anymore folks they use the term equity social justice diversity and inclusion and culturally responsive teaching and so those are some of the things uh, that they use one of the uh, ucla law professor and critical race theorist by the name of cheryl harris here's how far she's willing to go with critical race theory she has proposed suspending private property rights seizing land and wealth and distrib distributing them along racial lines she's at ucla that's a pretty prominent school the uh, 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 abram kendai who directs the center for anti-racist research at boston university he has proposed the creation of a federal department of anti-racism. The federal government would want to get involved in this. They want the power to nullify, veto, or abolish any law at any level of government and curtail the speech of political leaders and others who are deemed insufficiently racist. And who makes that determination? Uh, that's a good question. Probably... The Department of Anti Racists. Okay? Um, so, I'm telling you all this because, and now here's what's going to happen. In 2019, Southern Baptists at Birmingham, Alabama came up with a critical race theory resolution. And see, and the wording was, I believe, if I remember, I don't have it in front of me, I should have brought it. It could be used as a tool to help in discussion or something like that, all right? Well, there were Southern Baptists who were not happy with the language of that. So, folks, I'm telling you, next week, there's probably going to be a resolution. Now, these resolutions are, necessarily, are not necessarily binding, per se, but they do kind of speak for us as a denomination. So, there's probably going to be a resolution on CRT I haven't seen one yet but there's probably going to be one now the issue is is that we have some black churches that have come into the Southern Baptist Convention and we have made some inroads with our black brothers and sisters in Christ but some of them think that CRT is necessary and important as a tool to try to change some of the things that are happening in our country and some of them have threatened to leave the convention if we say no to CRT. So, again, just want to make you aware of that. There may be some uh, controversy in regards to that. Now, as your pastor, because of what I have read and what I have studied, I do not believe that critical race theory is a good tool, period. Folks, I believe that there are racists in America there are people who hate people because of their color and my friend that is wrong it's wrong okay it's wrong but not everybody in the United States is a racist okay and I've had opportunities God has given me opportunities to meet my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ of all race. And God has helped me to not have bias towards them. And uh, so um, to just systematically say that all of us of a certain color are automatically racist is wrong. And folks, to, you know, I don't know if you all knew this, um, 
there was supposed to have been an event in Tulsa with the Tulsa Race Massacre uh, last weekend around over Memorial Day. And they were supposed to have the three surviving uh, individuals of the race massacre. Um, all of them were over 100 years of age. And what, whoever the committee was, they were supposed to have um, <laughs> John Legend, who was, who's a singer, and who's the lady from Alabama, Stacey Abrams, was supposed to speak, okay? The lawyer for the three survivors, they were supposed to get $100,000 each, and they were going to put $5 million in a reparations fund for the black, Tulsa Black Massacre. The last week, the lawyer for these three said, no, we want a million dollars apiece, and we want $50 million in a reparations fund. And uh, somebody got greedy, okay? Now, I say that unapologetically. I'll probably be considered a lot of different things <laughs> after I say that tonight. But, folks, that was not right. And, folks, you can't, you can't right wrongs that happened a hundred years ago or even now. Listen, I'll be the first one to admit, I did not know about what happened in 1921 when I was in high school. I don't know why that wasn't brought out. And folks, that is a tragedy and it is a black mark on, the, uh, on Oklahoma and on the city of Tulsa. But how in the world can we start a process by which we're going to try to rectify our wrongs that go all the way back to 1776? Listen, our founding fathers, when they came up with the Declaration of Independence, they knew that there was slavery in the United States. And, and, and several of them wanted to see it eradicated. It took a civil war with over 500,000 people to die before we finally rectified that. And yet there were still racist attitudes. I know that. We've come a long way. We're not all the way there yet. But why are we going to, as a nation, immediately start tearing down statues and start rewriting history in order to try to change our country, what I believe, for the worst? So... This is what we're going to be dealing with, and I want you to know this. Um, let, me give you, let me give you just one example of one of these play, uh, uh, three-day re-education camps uh, in one of these businesses. And by the way, this is becoming very big in corporate America, okay? This is what one particular group, they had a three-day re-education plan. This was employees of a certain uh, business. They were told that white male culture was analogous to the KKK, white supremacist, and mass killings. The executives were then forced to renounce their white male privilege and write letters of apology to fictitious women and people of color. I ain't lying. That's exactly what happened. And I've got the documentation on that. Now, here's what we're, here's what I, here's, here's what we've got to as Christians. We've got to realize we have, here, here's what's happened. For fear of being called a racist, we're not saying anything. But as Christians, we've got to be willing to stand up and say, listen, this is not right. What we did in our country in the past is not right, but this clearly is not right. Folks, I'm not ready to give this country over to a bunch of Marxists. We've already seen what, can hap what will happen. So please begin to pray. Pray for our Southern Baptist Convention next week. Pray for us as messengers. Pray that we will make sound, good decisions based on the Word of God and not on the changing culture that is seeking. Remember what uh, Paul said in Romans 12? The world seeks to squeeze us into its mold. And I believe that means mentally, emotionally, physically, in every way. Satan wants us to follow him. 
And so we're going to have to decide tonight if we're going to stand up for God's principles and pray. We're going to have to do it on our knees. We're going to have to seek God's help. And then we need to uh, be willing to be bold and stand for the truth of God's word. Okay? So I wanted to share that with you. Okay. You, question or comment? No. Can't go. Sorry. Maybe next time. Philip, I don't think the world, I don't think the Southern Baptist Convention is ready for you yet. <laughs> I know. Okay. I agree with you. Well, I can't make them, but I'll persuade them, okay? Okay, I, I, you just, you pray, okay? You pray every morning, you pray for our convention this next week, okay? God can do wonders if we will let him, okay? So I, I wanted to do this tonight. It, I'm, it wasn't necessarily uh, the most inspiring speech or sermon you've ever heard. It wasn't even a sermon because I didn't really get into the text of anything. But I want you all to understand what's going on. And I ask you to pray for us, okay? Okay. Uh, they thought there was only going to be between five and 7,000 people, and they've already had 16,000 registered for this. Now, we've had, listen, folks, back in 1985, my wife was a part of the largest convention of Christians gathering together. There were 45,000 in Dallas, Texas, when we were going through a battle for the Bible. So uh, we've, we have corrected, for the most part, our theological issues. We are people of the book. But there are going to be some rogue churches out there that are going to do their own thing. You just need to understand that. Just like you, we've got, you've got some rogue uh, family members that are the black sheep of the family, and you just don't want to talk about them. Or maybe they're the white sheep of the family. I better quit, I better quit saying the word black. I'm going to be in trouble. Okay. Easy. All right. So anyway, uh, let me... Let me uh, share something with you here as far as prayer list and then we'll go I promise um, on your prayer list a couple of additions let me find my note here it is one of the additions is um, the great grandson of John Hillis Colton Leroy Hall he's two months old not gaining weight and uh, so uh, having some issues with him coming into this world. So remember little Colton tonight in your prayers. Also, Jerry Ham, one of our church members, uh, he was taken to uh, the emergency room this morning. They thought he might have had a mini stroke, but uh, he was lightheaded, and, but they did not find anything on a CAT scan or anything. So sent him back home, but he is going to see his primary doctor and his cardiologist, so pray for him tonight. We've been asked to pray for Kevin Bass, who is a pastor in Venita with stomach cancer, friend of Vera Mays. Uh, Rodney Bell, friend of Marcia Treese with bone cancer. This Jessica Smith that you see there, this is the daughter uh, of Doug and Brenda Bridges that are new members to our church. They sit kind of back here in this first section. He's got the real nice full beard. Um, they, uh, their daughter Jessica, she has breast cancer, but they found two lesions in her brain. So the first surgery today was to remove the first one, and it went well, and so far no cancer is involved. So pray for her. She's, uh, she needs our prayers. Uh, Julie Brixey's dad, George Vaughn, uh, healing of a broken ankle. And then our church family that you see there, uh, the Bolton family. Mark Clark is back from Mayo Clinic. He's looking good. Things went well uh, on his uh, uh, tests and things, and he's doing good. Uh, let's remember Gene Grounds, who was here at church. Uh, we got Wayne here on the Wayne Graham over here on our prayer list. Continue to pray for him. Uh, Tina Henry, uh, Jim and Billy Hausman, Charlene Pritchard is coming back from Houston. Uh, some, she may even be back, but she's on her way back. Let's remember the Shilt family in Malawi. Sidney Shaw got some good news. His can prostate cancer is contained, 
They're going to be able to use medication and some other things in order to help him. So that was a praise, so remember him tonight. Um, Justin Witt, uh, pray for him. I think if everything goes right, if his healing continues, he may get to go to Falls Creek with our kids, and that would be a great thing. Um, Carol Hicks' sister, who had surgery last week, Beverly Price, uh, is having some post-surgery issues. She's in ICU. Uh, where's she at? She's in, Cal in Michigan. Okay. Uh, got AFib, so just pray for her. She's just having some, they did the, uh, the valve, aortic. Aortic, aortic valve, but just, just some issues as a result of that, okay? And then also on there, Sandra Lemon, stage four breast cancer. Let's remember uh, her tonight and Mary Hamilton. This is Brenda and Sharon Bridges' mother. She has breast cancer, but she's undergoing treatments, okay? So a lot of prayer requests. I ask you to pray again for myself, our staff, as we go. Pray for safety and uh, pray that you don't see your pastor or business administrator or family ministries pastor on the news next week okay i'm not on facebook so i should be okay there but uh you might pray that the lord you know the what is the bible i had a friend of mine that told me in church brother jim you have two ears and one mouth with me which means you ought to listen twice as much as you speak so i'm going to try to remember that okay all right i'm going to close this in a word of prayer thank you for being here tonight and uh, appreciate it, fellowship with one another. Those of you who inquire, Brother Matt's going to be with you, okay? So let's bow for prayer. Father, we live in a very difficult world. I believe that Satan's try to, trying to do everything he can to divide. You've told us in your word that a house divided cannot stand. And the Holy Spirit is not a spirit of confusion. So, Father, I believe that you want us to experience peace. I believe that you want us to experience unity. There's a difference between unity and uniformity. We don't necessarily all believe the same thing. But when it comes to the basics, we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe that salvation is by grace through faith. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It is inerrant, infallible. We believe that you gave it to us. We believe in you God Almighty, that you have revealed yourself in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe, Lord, that you have, uh, that Jesus died for the church. We believe, Lord, that you're coming back. Your Son, Jesus Christ, is coming back visibly, literally. We can hold on to those tonight. Help us in this difficult world. Help us not to, help us, we know how to curse the darkness. Sometimes we do it too much. Help us to shine the light of Christ. Be with us as a church. Be with us as a state convention here in Oklahoma. Be with us as a national convention. Remind us of what our priorities are, and that is to live for you, share the gospel, make disciples. Go with us as we leave, realizing that when we leave this place, we're going out into the mission field. We love you and we thank you and we pray this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed.